It's the big finale, right? This is what we've been preparing all, all December for, is the exciting conclusion of Advent, this, this moment that we've been leading up to. We started four weeks ago with hope, and, and we trusted in that hope to see that God would intervene in our lives, and we looked back at the promises of who God was and, and his coming. And then we talked about love, and we talked about how we can love others, even our enemies, because of the love that God has given to us. And then Ed shared with us about joy and about rejoicing and how that springs forth from us if we are followers of Jesus. We are people of great joy. And joy looks at our circumstances and say they don't matter because of the salvation that is waiting for us. Then we talked about peace and and how Jesus is the Prince of Peace and how that peace can be in our lives and and create this deep gentleness and love inside of us as we look at peace and we extend that peace and become peacemakers in our community. And so now we come down to this main event, the story of Christmas. And as we open up this story, it always reminds me because we all have traditions, right? Right? We all have things that we do in our own families that create a Christmas tradition. Our family, we love movies. And I remember watching all of these different movies growing up, even on to now. I know some of you, you know, you saw a miracle on 34th Street. I have too. Black and white version. Only real version there is. I'm with you. But, you know, we have, the, we have these stories, and then I've seen pieces of, of A Wonderful Life. I tried to watch it once, but I get tired, and naps are good. And proof of God's goodness. And so, you know, we see these different things, and it creates this imagery for us that as we do them again and again and again, they help us to welcome the Christmas season, whether it's the Santa Claus or, or Home Alone or a Christmas story or Elf, which people tend to love. But I think the best Christmas movies are Gremlins and Die Hard. There's caroling, the gremlins carol. It's totally a Christmas story. And then nothing says Christmas like stopping a terrorist from taking over Hakatami Tower. I mean, these are the stories that help us to usher in this new year. And so we start to prepare our own hearts. But you see, the thing is, as we look at this Christmas story and as we look again and again at Scripture for how it should shape our lives, we cannot allow the good news to become just a nice tradition. We can't allow the good news to be something we've read so much that we just become numb to it. We have to allow it to transform us. So as we look at this story this morning, as we look at it, I ask you to come with fresh eyes to look at this and see how it should transform our lives and change us from the inside out. You see, in this Christmas story, there's all of these images that can lure us into just viewing it as something that we do each year. We think about the shepherds, we think about the angels, we think about a manger, and all that imagery, you can think, oh, that's in the nativity scene. Or you talk about, you know, the drummer boy, because, you know, every new mother is just waiting for someone to show up and play drums for their infant, because that's, that's what it would just be every new mother's dream. But, you know, we see these stories and it does not create a great background for what is actually going on here. Now, if you have heard, if you've been sticking around here for a while, we've talked about this promise that was given to Abraham. We just looked at the life of Abraham and Jesus is a fulfillment of that promise. So this story of Christmas goes all the way back to Genesis. It goes all the way back to there because it starts with Abraham and God giving him a promise that says, one day all the nations will be blessed from your offspring. And so the story builds from there. And as we look at the nation of Israel, ultimately they're going to get, they're going to be in Egypt as slaves and they're going to wait for God to free them. And when they do, they go to Mount Sinai and God gives them the law. And the law is a gift so that they know how to be in relationship with him. But you see, Israel was given the gift and they were given a call as a nation. Not only was the Messiah going to come for them, come from them, from their descendants, but 
they were to be in the world a light. They were to be the place for all other nations could come to Israel and learn what it means to be in relationship with God. That was their call as a nation. But it doesn't take Tom time, much time to look through scripture that even while Moses was up there getting the law, Israel rebelled, and that starts a cycle of rebellion over and over and over again. And throughout their history, we see the prophets arising and proclaiming God's word back to them, reminding them of their call, reminding of the law that they were to keep, but they kept on walking away. And they kept on walking away. And you see this story cycle again and again and again, all the way up to the point into which the prophet Jeremiah says this. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 2. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. Because the leaders of Israel were exploiting the people and enriching themselves, God's anger is kindled. And throughout their history, when they are exploiting the people, were exploiting the poor to elevate themselves, God's anger is kindled again and again and again. And so he says this, He says, myself, I will gather the remnant of my flock, the flock that had been scattered. And out of all the countries where I have driven them, I will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any of them be missing declares the Lord. He goes, I'm going to give them shepherds who are going to care for them, not ones that are going to scatter them. And he says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. I'm going to give you a Messiah. And in those days, Judah will be saved. Israel lived in safety and his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous savior. He says, I am going to give you a Lord and a savior. And so you got to think in this promise, they're pretty excited about it because he says, you know, you've been scattered, you've been mistreated, and it's gone really bad, and they're about to go into exile. And this is happening about 600 years before the New Testament takes place. He says, you're going to go into exile, but there's a promise with that. You're going to get a Lord and a Savior. And this is promise of the Messiah, the promise of the fulfilling of the promise given to Abraham is now this promise of a Messiah that's going to come. But when is it going to happen? I just mentioned it's been 600 years before Jesus shows up. So you got to think, they're going, the timing on this thing, God, have you forgotten about us? That's the backdrop for this story. Is Israel's disobedience, God's grace, and a long time in between? A long time. So when these words are uttered, it calls attention to Israel because Advent is the conclusion of the Old Testament. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinus was governor of Syria and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the line of David. He's of the right house because they knew the Messiah was going to come from David. So this sets up a story that draws us in. This sets up a story of, could this be the Messiah that's promised? He's got the right pedigree and he's going to the right town. Could this be the one? He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, who was expecting a child. So imagine this scene. They're going into Bethlehem, 
which he's probably never been to in his lifetime. Joseph grew up in Nazareth. Though he's from the line of David, he's probably never seen Bethlehem. So he rolls into town unmarried with a girl expecting a child. That's scandal. You got to wonder, why is there no room for them in the inn? You think, well, good people would make room for a pregnant woman, but well, not when they're unsavory because that's a scandal. And no good Bible-believing person would allow such a scandal under their roof. They made their bed. They lay in it. And so they show up into Bethlehem. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And that's how Jesus enters into our world. That's how the promised Messiah comes into the world, into a manger. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping their watch over their flocks at night. Now, I know that you all know what a shepherd is. I know that you all know, but you have to understand context for this. Now, you see, the shepherds is kind of, it's like the original job. Because, you know, you've got sheep and you got to take care of them so that, hey, the shepherd is born. But you see, in this culture, the shepherds really had no status. It would be a weird first person to announce the creator, you know, of the entire world coming into human body. This is not the first person that you would alert. You would not go, let's go let the shepherds know. Because everybody listens to the shepherds. No, nobody listens to the shepherds. That's why they're out in the field all the time. And so it says that they're out in the field watching over the flock by night, which is something that would happen kind of spring, early fall. And they would be staying with the flocks out there because the shepherd's job was to guard and protect the sheep and to make sure that they had food and water. Now, having sheep had meant status, but being a shepherd meant no status. So they were kind of the unwashed masses. They were the unwelcome poor. They were the people that you were happy when they were out in the field, but they had their job, which was to watch and protect the sheep because sheep are not really ferocious animals. They need lots of protection. You don't go, oh no, a sheep, run. It's just not something that normally happens. They don't have claws or sharp teeth, but they're also stupid. They will go with anyone. If you come and pick up a sheep and walk off with them, they'll be like, yay, new owner. They're kind of like cats in that way. Zero loyalty. If you feed a cat, they will stay with you forever. I think that's how we got cats growing up. We just put out food and then a cat stayed and it was really good because it would take care of the rodents that were trying to kill our baby chickens. And that's how we ended up with cats. No loyalty. Sheep, same way. They're willing to just be with who's ever going to take care of them. And so you needed the shepherds to stay with them. So these are not really necessarily the people that you would announce a king's birth to. And that's God's sense of humor. He goes and he finds the people who are awake because this is great news. The angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Ah, angels. These are not, you know, little chubby babies that you'd be like, oh, cute angels. Oh, something nice must have happened. No, these were terrifying creatures. If you want to look at a description of an angel, go to Ezekiel. Not something you want to bump into at night. Eyes everywhere, wings crying out all the time. These are not just kind of tame little timid creatures that are nice to put on your nativity scene. These are God's messengers. We've talked about this before. They show up and they change the course of human history because it's God's announcement. We looked at it when Hagar was in the wilderness after she was driven away by Abraham and Sarai that she got a message because God's messenger showed up to her. It means that God means to intervene. He shows up to these individuals and he had talked to Mary and he told her the story you're going to be with a child. You're going to name him Jesus. So now that same group of angels are now appearing to the shepherds in the middle of the field, and they go, we've got great news, and they're terrified because this is not something that happens every night. I'm usually terrified when just one of my kids wakes me up from a dead sleep. You can only imagine angels waking me up. 
You know, or, or kind of the worst part was when my kids were little and they would dive bomb me for Christmas because, you know, dad will be excited if we land on him to wake him up. Oh, not so much. But, you know, they're woken from a dead sleep by these angels, by this great noise. And they say this, they say, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Probably not, you know, many people in that scenario. So easy to find. And this is good news. That's going to cause great joy for everyone. So go find this child, this Messiah, the one that you've been waiting for for hundreds of years. Tonight's the night that he's going to be born. It says, suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. So this musical breaks out in the middle of a field. This choir shows up out of nowhere and starts singing. And you got to imagine these shepherds are bewildered, but it seems like a big deal because, you know, God doesn't make appearances every day. So we should go check this out. It says, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Let's go find him. We don't know if they drove the sheep with them into the city, which would be a scene in and of itself, but it says that they get up and go immediately. They got to see this thing that the angels proclaim. It said, so they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. So it says that they find him, and they're like, there he is, there's a baby, let's tell everybody. So they go around the city just spreading word of anybody who will listen that there's a baby that the angels told them about, and they came and found him, and he's in a manger, and it's amazing news. Because angels, I, I don't know about you, but no angels showed up when my kids were born. So this is significant. This is good news. It's been 400 years since the Old Testament was closed, but the writing of Malachi. So now this new thing is happening. They've been waiting for it, but now it's taking place. It's very exciting news. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. It says that she knew what God had told her. But now all of these amazing things are happening around her baby. And she just treasures those things about what's being said. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So they praised God as a response to seeing this baby in a manger. Because God said it, it's here. This is incredible. This is the the Lord and Savior that we've been waiting for. And so they they, they make this huge ruckus about the birth of Jesus. The shepherds and the angels follow suit in the same way. It says this, on the eighth day when he was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus. The name the angel had given him before he was conceived, which means Yahweh saved. And it says that the Messiah had come. And though we have seen, read this story before and we know how it works out, this was different than what they had envisioned. You wouldn't think shepherds would be the first to know, but this is the good news, but it's also a huge reversal. You see, they were waiting for a king. He's going to be from the line of David, so he was going to be a king. So clearly that king would be born in a palace because that's where kings are born. And they have, you know, just amazing attendance at their birth. 
You know, it, it would be this great ceremony, this revealing of the new king is born. That's what they had thought in their mind. They said, that's how it's going to happen. It's not going to be some teenage pregnancy in a manger in Bethlehem. It's going to be in a, te- it's going to be in a great palace. So they're confused by this. Anyone that would hear the shepherds saying, they'd be go, well, wait, this is not really how we thought it would happen. What's going on? The glory of heaven in a manger. It's a strange thing. And it's announced to shepherds who would be the least of society. There's this big reversal that God is doing in the midst where all the glory of heaven is coming to be incarnate in a baby boy and it's announced to the poor of society first because, you know, the wealthy, they probably have a calendar and they couldn't, you know, necessarily fit this birth in. It's nice. We'll send a present. But these shepherds are available and their lives are transformed. But you see this announcement to the common folk, the way in which Jesus came, it makes the message accessible to everyone. This birth of Jesus in such a common way. It makes it accessible to each and every person. He's not way up there outside of anything that we can understand. We can understand this. And so when God says, I'm going to send a shepherd, a leader, a Messiah, he wanted him to be accessible to every single person. When Mary gets this news about who Jesus is going to be, she sings this song, which encapsulates what his life is going to look like. It says, and Mary said, she's filled with the Holy Spirit and cries out, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy, holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. She gets it. Jesus is going to do great things. He's going to reverse what would be the status quo, and he's changing the world. You see, it's kind of those, you know, we see the shepherds announcing and celebrating Jesus. We see the angels doing the same thing, probably a lot louder. But it comes down to you. That's where the story comes down to. It comes down to today, to you to what's going on in your heart. Because you see, we know the angels, they're really good at spreading the good news. We know the shepherds did an awesome job. They like woke everybody up in the city to tell them about Jesus. But what are we doing? You see, it comes down to us. Christmas has to be an announcement of good news. It has to be an announcement that in our lives, we share good news with others. Whether that's giving of our time to help a family that needs a little bit of help or giving up of our resources to help someone, that's how we announce this good news. And we get the opportunity to share who Jesus is. He's transformed my life, so I offer this good news to you because it is good news. It is something that needs to be shared. When you all went and saw a movie 
for the first time. You made the announcement. Hey, you got to go see Elf. It's an amazing movie. Go see it. It's still in the theaters. Or you got to go see Spider-Man. It's incredible. All this great stuff happens, and I'm a good person, so I won't spoil it for you, but you should go see it so we can talk about it. You want to share this news. Every single day, my son tells me who is on the COVID-19 list for the NFL and who is activated and who's coming off injured reserve. It's good news sometimes. Depends on who we're playing. But it, we share it because it's big. This is the same thing with Jesus. We share it because it's bigger than the NFL. It's bigger than a new movie. It has the power to change us transform us, to make us into new people. So this morning, so, you know, it's the first day of Christmas was yesterday, so we all got our partridges in the pear tree. Now we get our two turtle doves. Today, this morning, I want to ask you, are we looking at this good news as a nice tradition, or are we allowing it to be transformative in our lives? Are we sharing this good news or are we just making it into something that we do every year, a nice tradition that's going to go away and we don't have to think about it till next December? Is that what this Christmas story has come, this beginning of the gospel, or is it a good news that you're sharing? If you're a follower of Jesus, how are you sharing it this morning? But if you're here and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, the announcement of the angels was you get a Lord and a Savior, and that's who Jesus is. He's our Savior that we can't save ourselves. We can't do enough good things. We can't even be good on Christmas to get onto the good list. We need a Savior, and that's what he does. He saves us from our sins. He takes our sin, gives us his righteousness so that we can be in relationship with God. That's what Jesus does, and that's why we call him our Savior. But he's also our Lord. He saves us and he shows us how to live our lives. He shows us how to measure our days, what it means to be a loving person. He reveals that in his gospel. So he saves us and then he becomes our Lord. He shows us how to live. That's who Jesus is. So if you've never made a decision to follow him and you feel God pulling on your heart this morning, I want to encourage you. Give your life to him. Let him allow, to, allow, allow him to change your life today. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word. Because it gives us hope. It gives us love. It gives us joy and it gives us peace. May we be people who allow those things to take root in our life and let us share the good news about who Jesus is. Give us opportunities, God, to do that, even this week. May our joy be so evident that others become curious about the rejoicing that can be going on. Let our peace be so evident that we look at the world and don't worry so that people might ask how let our love be so evident, may we give of ourselves to such a degree in which people become curious about somebody who would love like that. Give us that opportunity this week. But for those who've never made a decision to follow you, I pray for them right now that they would give in to the grace that you're calling them by. So that they might be transformed by this gospel story. So if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus and you feel this wrestling match going on in your heart and you want to give your life to Christ this morning, say these words to yourself as I say them out loud. And God will meet you right where you're at this morning and change your life. So if you're ready, say, Father God, thank you. Thank you for revealing yourself through scripture. 
I admit I'm in need of salvation. And I want to confess that I'm a sinner. Jesus, be my Savior. Because I cannot save myself. And be my Lord. Show me how to live. Holy Spirit, give me the strength to begin this new life today. Amen.